Okay. Hi, everyone. We're back, and I've got Andy. Hi, Andy. Hi, Talia. I'm glad to be here. This is great. I know. I'm so excited. I was just um, praising you over in the other session before about how I met you at Conversion Conference in Chicago, and mm -hmm. I've basically been content stalking you for years, just like reading everything you put out there and just following every tip that you have. Um, so you guys have to listen to Andy and write down everything because <laughs> he is a genius. Um, but without further ado, I'm just going to let you get started because you know your stuff. Sure, sure. Um, and I'm just going to remove videos. So okay. That's better. Um, and you can go ahead and share your screen. Very good. So, so uh, are you seeing my screen now? Um, no, I am not. Let's okay, let me, let me press that button again just to make sure. See if we're... Uh, share screen, share second window. You should be seeing a couple of mountains now. And yes, sure. here you are. Awesome. Yeah. We've got okay, it. cool. Are we, are we live? Yes, we're live and everyone Excellent. can see you and can hear you. And if you have any questions, guys, pop it in the chat as usual and I will ask Andy at the end. Cool. And so the camera, we're, we're going to leave the camera on? I've, I've closed it. They can't see you. Okay, no problem. <laughs> I just, just so I know not to uh, uh, do anything foolish. Great. I'm excited. I love this topic. I want to start by saying that uh, a lot of people maybe have read or seen things I've done about search optimization or analytics or social media or all kinds of topics related to traffic. Uh, it wasn't until more recently that I went deep, deep into this one, which is actually a more natural topic for me because our company here, Orbit Media in Chicago, all we do is build websites. So actually, uh, I love this one because this is all about conversion optimization and CRO. And Talia, you and I have like totally shared this passion and obsession with conversion. Uh, this is going to be a content-based approach uh, to conversion, regardless of what type of conversion or what your goals are, whether they're leads or subscribers or customers or event registrants or donors or whatever the goals are, right? This is the, the people who take action, the people who change status, the people who used to be just a visitor. Now they are a lead subscriber, customer, registrant, donor, whatever the goal is. Now, content, I'm going to make the case that content is critical because content actually, according to this guy, is the main problem with our websites. That is the one and only Jacob Nielsen, but he's Danish. I think it's Jakob Nielsen. I'm going to say Jakob. I think I'm switching over. I think that's the real pronunciation for his name. Um, and he is the nngroup.com. He is the guy who writes all the research that all of us read and follow. Uh, he's the real pro at this. Uh, and he's been a passionate evangelist for user experience for uh, forever. He did studies way back when, like 2004, to test how effective websites are, how good the internet is, and actually produced data that showed that uh, um, there was a success rate, an average success rate among a bunch of websites, a bunch of users, a bunch of tasks. And then he did it again. He did it again later with, uh, in 2016 to check to see if the internet got any better. And the answer is the internet did get a little bit better, <laughs> but not that much better. So he kind of concludes that, um, you know, at the, pay, at the rate of improvement, the internet will be good in the year 2030. Kind of a joke, but he extrapolates and says, like, this is, you know, something's wrong. Something could be better. What is the problem? If this is the goal, degree of task success, success where everything is easy, what is the problem? The problem, he concludes, is findability. People want information and they're not finding it. That is the main reason why people fail at their tasks and the main reason why our websites fail at converting visitors is because it leaves a question. There's something missing. There's some unanswered question, some unfulfilled piece of information that the visitor didn't find. And our job then, content-based approach to CRO is to answer that question. Okay? So where there's a lot of CROs out there and I come back from a conference and Talia just mentioned conversion conference and I've been to call to action conference and all these places where there's all different types of CROs, right? Some are interested in maybe testing, some do landing page optimization, some are all about visuals and eye tracking and some are about cognitive bias and conversion, you know, motion and, and triggers. I'm just talking about the content, right? Because this is the game. <laughs> this is the battle. This is the point. Traffic times your conversion rate of success. There are two numbers that matter most in marketing. The total number of visitors we we attract and the percentage of those people who take action. And our job is to maximize both. Every action you take in marketing should be designed specifically 
to increase traffic or increase the conversion rate or why on earth did you do it? Okay, I've got, um, we were just talking just before we came on uh, about uh, family and uh, our host here has a five month old. I have a 15 month old, so just a little bit ahead. Um, and I'm only partly kidding when I say that I want this little guy to be good at two things in life. SEO and CRO, because he is going to be rich if he can. <laughs> that's it. If you know search and if you know conversion, you are you know how to create demand on the internet. That's the game. So he's actually bigger than this now. That was when he was just a tiny little guy. Um, he's growing up fast. He's actually extremely bright. He's well on his way to being an expert conversion rate optimizer because uh, he's totally into the data side of things. Very analytical uh, for a one year old. Um, that's obviously, I'm kidding. In the next slide, he tried to eat, in the next picture, he tried to eat the book. Um, he doesn't know what he's looking at there, but we'll teach him someday. I'm going to send him to the, uh, the, the webinars that get uplift and he'll be well on his way. So what are we talking about? I'm talking about the conversion pages. I'm talking about the sales pages. There are actually, think about it, two kinds of visitors to every website. Your website has two kinds of visitors. Anyone who does any kind of content marketing has two kinds of visitors. We have transactional visitors and we have informational visitors. And they find us by searching for two different phrase, two different types of phrases. They search for the transactional phrases, the money phrase, and they search for the informational phrase, the query, right? The, the, uh, they're just looking for information. I call those two kinds of phrases question marks and dollar signs. Question marks are people just reading blog content, right? They're like the 80% of all searches, even in your browsing history, are for informational queries. 10% of all searches, even in your browsing history, are for the dollar sign phrases. So these two kinds of people, two kinds of visitors, two kinds of searchers, land on two kinds of pages, our products and service pages and our content marketing content. The page is designed to sell and the page is designed to get people to subscribe. The pages that fill the bottom of the funnel and the pages that make us, you know, increase awareness top of funnel and, um, you know, visibility, brand. So I'm going to make the case that really if you, if you want the fortune, the conversion, you've got to get the glory first because it's these pages that drive the subscribers, followers, and links that power our email, our social, and our search. You get the idea. Mostly what I'm talking about today though, and like I said, people ask me all the time about search. I've done 16 or 17 years of search optimization and I've done lots of email marketing and social and content. But uh, today this is all about how to maximize percentage of people who land on these products and service pages, your programs, and take action because we're gonna go through a framework on how to maximize the percentage of people who act. But it's important to understand it this way, right? Two kinds of visitors, two kinds of phrases, there's two kinds of pages and two kinds of conversions. This, by the way, before we move on, there's a good reason why I almost never would link from a product or service page to an article. Why? I don't really want my visitors going backwards, upwards through the funnel. You'll see. I'm going to focus on the specific action I want them to take. People who come to us for a service like WordPress web design or something, right? I want them to convert and become a lead uh, for that specific thing. So here's the framework. We're going to go from answers to action. Uh, it's actually relevant, even though this is like hundreds of years old. St. Thomas Aquinas said that if we want to convert someone, you have to take them by the hand and guide them. That's an actual quote from a saint who talks about converting people in a different context, but it's the same message. We have to guide them by the hand. We have to take them to go from a stranger right, to a lead, from a suspect to a prospect. We have to make that, and we do so by making that first arrow. This is like junior high geometry. Make that first arrow bigger and stronger, make that second arrow smaller and weaker. Increase motivation and reduce friction. One way we can do that, with content, simply by answering questions. Answers make the first arrow bigger. Uncertainty, even a little bit of uncertainty, keeps that visitor from converting. So here's our framework. They have questions. Our job is to provide answers to the questions, evidence to support those answers, and clear specific calls to action. Let's do a quick B2C example. My faucet is leaking. Great. My, my question when I go to your website is how soon can you fix my leaky faucet? I've got water on my floor. The answer has to be present or I'm less likely to convert. An answer in this case might be something like this. Same day on time service for 20 years. Question answered. Evidence. I want to support that answer with evidence. I'll do a quick testimonial. I'm so glad they came right away. Get it? You can feel it? You can feel it. 
The action also indicates time and is in context of this visitor's concerns. Schedule a visit, right, within 24 hours, or maybe the, maybe the call to action mentions emergency. Let's go now to the other end of the spectrum, an extreme example of a, of a high consideration thing, a B2C example of a, of a long sales cycle with multiple decision makers. Maybe you're gonna buy a million dollars worth of marketing technology. Question, does this system connect with my database? Common question, right? Answer, it integrates with the top 50 platforms. Okay, sounds good, right? I'm, I'm feeling it. Evidence, thanks for the help connecting to my system. Or maybe just logos of the tools with which you integrate. Action, I'm gonna lower the psychological threshold, the commitment of contacting this company by using a call to action that just says chat with, don't spend money, just chat with an expert about what? Integration. The action is contextual to the visitor's top concern. Now, I'm also doing this uh, at another event coming up. It's all for the senior housing industry or senior care. Senior care is different, has in-home care and senior housing, which is when you move. Here's a question, can I bring my dog? Yes, we are pet friendly. If you don't tell them that and they leave the, un the question unanswered, well, I don't want to move. I might have to leave my dog. But if I answer the question, the visitor is more likely to act. That first arrow of motivation and answer is stronger. The evidence, Buster loves his new friends. Okay, you got it. There's a happy dog there. <laughs> I can imagine my dog being happy there. I see evidence. Action, discuss pet relocation with a sales associate. Okay, if I got another question, I can ask them. Here's non-medical. Uh, in home care, in home care, right? Can you, my, can you help my mom with her meals? The adult child influencer is a huge thing in senior care, right? So this audience may not be the, the, the person who needs the care, might be the adult child influencer. Yes, our caregivers prepare healthy meals. The evidence, contextual. Janice cooked the salmon perfectly, right? This is the voice of the audience. Action, how can we plan and prepare healthy meals? Now there are all kinds of answers. I'm gonna show you a quote from Justin Rondeau, whom many of you may know, works at digitalmarketer.com, expert, right? Shout out to Justin, absolute pro, love Justin, and he's done thousands, literally thousands of A-B tests, so he really knows what he's talking about, and he summarizes CRO in this way. Optimization is about meeting the user's expectations. Page elements anticipate their questions or objections, and the page design prioritizes the answers. So simple, right? It makes perfect sense. And he gives the example, of, he gave his presentation in Boston last year of questions the page must answer. And there, he's right. You know, who's the company? What do I get? Is it valuable? Is my information safe? That's good. The problem is it's generic to all websites. I want to explain now how that is insufficient. Yes, we must, you know, we must answer the questions that our audience, right? What does your audience ask before buying? What specific things does your audience need to have answered before they buy? I asked this question in the meeting for a higher ed grad school, grad school program, in a meeting with like all their admissions advisors and all their, all, you know, the librarians and all the different teams, the deans of students and curriculum. Their answer to this question was so rich, I couldn't write down all of their, it's like they gave me 60 different questions people ask before they apply. Wow, I really have to answer these. Or my visitors are left likely to convert. This is, this is the job. Someone asked me once, tell me in a word, one word, what my website needs to do. Great question, someone asked me that. Andy, tell me what my website needs to do in one word. My response, answer. If you're not sure what questions your audience is asking, you can use answerthepublic.com to scrape from the internet all kinds of questions that people ask on any topic, put in any topic, put in your topic, and you'll see I put in web design, that's what we do. Look at all these questions people ask related to web design. Are any of those questions people ask during the sales process? If so, I must answer these questions on my pages. So I ask all my, my, I have three people who are strategists, they do sales every day, and I ask them, what are the things people ask you? Please keep notes, for several months I sort up all those questions. Then when we went to shoot the videos for our site, I gave those questions to the guy that was shooting videos so he could ask those questions in our little about us videos. It's made a huge difference. I'll show you the results from our redesign shortly. So. Find out what those questions are that people ask before buying, right? Let's find out what those questions are that people always ask, the things people need to know. Okay, so now that we're gonna provide our answers, I wanna suggest that we do it in a couple of different ways. You know what the message, now it's the answer, but what is the messenger? And what is the format? You can answer that and you can answer it with text and that's great, it's better than not doing it, but it's also the weakest 
messenger, that's you, and the weakest format, that's text. Number one in on-time deliveries, right? We, we, we fix drains every day, or we connect with your systems, or we do your home shopping for your, you know, or you can bring your pet. That's fine, but consider upgrading. Before we move on, just consider upgrading that messenger and that format. And a better example, let the customer say it, right? Buster has new friends, right? Or, it, for, you know, that was quick, thanks for being prompt. You know, fixed my sync right away. And you can do it with text, and I like that. Another way to do it, and this is, if don't miss the chance to do this, use a third-party endorsement and you do so as a visual, right? These kind of trust seals, awards, association memberships, security certificates, put them all together. It's not answering the top question and as Justin suggested, we need to prioritize these things. So you can put them at the bottom, maybe like in a trust box, they call it, right? Put those together, it'll improve conversions. It's a third-party endorsement and it's visual, it's an upgrade. But the ultimate would be the customer testimonial, especially for B2B. So let the customer say it and let them say it with tone of voice and body language and motion, right? In the visual hierarchy, motion is more powerful than images. Images are more powerful than text. That is the upgrade, the potential upgrade to the formats. You get the idea. And this brings up our next point in our framework, which is evidence. We went from questions to answer. Now we're in evidence. Evidence makes the first make the first arrow bigger and the second arrow smaller. Now there's two kinds of evidence we can add. We can add, and, and I'm going to base this on like, this is going to sound kind of like college for a second here, Aristotle's modes of persuasion. He called it pathos, logos, and ethos. Really, that's like uh, Greek, maybe? The Greek way to say emotion, reason, and ethics. Or let's make it even more street, <laughs> heart, head, and cred. This is the emotional evidence. This is the reason evidence. And this is just credibility and um, image and appearance and brand value and trustworthiness. So I'm going to focus on the first two, and I'm going to show you ways to add evidence that leverage emotion and ways to add evidence that leverage reason, the heart and the head. The reason is the big evidence. It's like the big story, and it's, qual it's quantitative. It's numbers, right? And it's percentage increases in ROI and hours saved or dollars or years in business and you know number of clients, and that's good because especially for a personality type who likes information, there's decision makers everywhere who are, uh, we'd call it a high C on a disk test. They like to hoard information and they want data and they like that, right? I've done di digital marketing for 17 years. It sounds good, right? But what's more powerful than that is the small evidence, the qualitative stories. It appeals to the heart with reason. Those are the, those are the testimonials and examples in the voice of the audience, right? The reviews. You, this format is very familiar to anybody who's ever read a newspaper article because that's how journalists tell stories, right? The volcano exploded and 20,000 people had to move from their homes. And little Johnny got separated from his dog. You know, the number is not as powerful as the little story. Rob Biesenbach puts it this way. Facts are called cold and hard for a reason. They don't have the ability to warm hearts which is the key to changing people's minds. Conversion, we got to add the story, the testimonial, uh, the little the little story, you know, the, the, the ethos, um, or the, I'm sorry, the pathos. But you can do both, and it, you got a tall page. You, there's no, no rush. Here is an example from the top of one of our pages from our recent website redesign we did for ourselves. Fun example, because I've got all the analytics, and I can show you here. We put this at the top, 41%. That's the average increase in conversion rates from the last 20 websites we launched. Cool, right? Great. And there's an information uh, hungry personality type that likes that, likes that data. But on that same page, I also had a testimonial from a client. It sounds like this. Without question, choosing Orbit Media to design and develop our website was the best business decision I made in 25 years. I can't write copy that good. <laughs> that is super powerful. Think of it this way. Everything that you say is marketing, but everything they say is social proof, right? This is the little story that makes it very powerful. So I recommend making testimonials a big part of the site uh, for almost anybody, right? Reviews if it's B2C, testimonials for B2B. And here's seven tips for adding testimonials to your website. If the logo is recognizable to the audience, right? Put that logo there. You know, it's the company logo. It's also more visual, increases the visual prominence. And there's the headline. Take the six juiciest words out of the headline or out of the testimonial and make them a headline. 
add headlines to your testimonials. Ever thought of this? There's a good reason why Amazon makes you write a little headline for every review. That's because it increases the visual prominence. People will see it. Then you add the testimonial, of course, which everyone was going to add anyway. Now I'm going to make the person real by adding the picture, the name, the company, the, the, a link, link back to them. Why not? It doesn't cost you anything. Um, in my experience, they don't get that many clicks. If you're tracking exit, exit clicks in Google Analytics using event tracking, maybe set up using Google Tag Manager, you can see if people click on these. It's, they're probably not, but I always link to anyone who gives a testimonial because it's a little thank you. But, but I can also add the key phrase. Look, this is a key phrase focused testimonial. A key phrase focused testimonial is doing hard work on both the SEO and the CRO side. It can help attract more visitors and convert more visitors at the same time. A key phrase focused testimonial is both cheese and mousetrap, right? This is affecting both of the two numbers that we need to affect in marketing. So never miss the opportunity to use a key phrase in a testimonial. There's even special ways to interview your clients in ways that elicit key phrases in their answers, which you can then use in your content. Sneaky, right? Powerful. So uh, beyond that, we're going to, uh, I want to make the case that there's, we should be adding um, lots of testimonials and that testimonials aren't something that we should just have one or two of. We built our website and we said, you know, let's, let's put a testimonial on these pages. But actually, it's maybe we need to put more than one testimonial. I'm going to show you an example of a, of a page that has uh, this is B to C. This is the book page. I, the book I did, this is the Amazon page for it. Pan out, grab Photoshop, use it like a ruler and count the pixel height. 7,200 pixels, this page. Now I'm going to show you what, how much of this page is evidence. 3,100 pixels of this page are evidence and proof. That is 43% of the page. If 43% of your page is evidence, <laughs> maybe we need to be adding more evidence and social proof to pages than people thought, right? Maybe there's not an upper limit. Maybe there's, we should be adding tons of it. Let's look at another example. This is Ali Gardner's page where Ali is make, where uh, his speaker page, Ali's a, a pro speaker. And he's using this tactic, of course, where he's looking at the, the headline. You've probably seen this, maybe you're familiar with it, and it can make the visitor's attention go in a certain direction. Literally, line of sight. He's looking at something, therefore, you look at something. And there's a dozen or 100 eye tracking studies that show this. This is one from Conversion XL. The dude looks away, you could say, creepy dude looks away from the form, creepy dude looks toward the form, arrow points toward the form. Which of these gets the visitor to look at the form the most? Actually, the surprise here is that the arrow, these little arrows are just dominant. They're really powerful at getting people to look at things. If you want someone to look at something, try giving it an arrow. Just point to it with a visual element. It happens, it seems to work really well. Also, this back to Ali's speaker page, he's using color to guide our attention toward the call to action, the button. That is an orange button on a blue background. In other words, that is a warm color in a cool context. In other words, those are the opposite sides of the color wheel. Blue and orange are at the opposite ends of the color wheel. So that, that strong contrast draws the visitor's attention to that button. So he's deliberately, you know, he's very carefully getting you to look down there. Do so deliberately whenever you have used color. This is not a real page. It's a fake mocked up page, but uh, cool, light, gray, blue, right? Website, header, logo. Now, the icons over here are, are bright and loud and uh, large. Not really ideal because they're going to dominate the visitor's attention and encourage them to click, which in this case, those social icons are going to leave your website. Do you really want them to click on these things? There's so many distractions there. I highly recommend against putting big social media icons on the headers of your pages. Why would you want your visitors to click that? How does that help your marketing? How does that increase conversion rates? They're not going to come back. Visitors who click on big social media icons leave your site. And they go to a site where there's tons of distractions. They go to a site where there's this little guy. Do you really want your visitors going to a website where they can find this? this? I totally forgot what we were talking about. Look at how cute that thing is. See, distraction. <laughs> where there's traffic, there's hope. Do not send your visitors away, if at all possible because you want to keep them on your site because it's on your site that they're going to convert. So it should be obvious, but please do not add big social media icons to the headers of pages. Uh, if you do them, put them at the bottom of the page, gray them out until the visitor rolls over them. 
Uh, there is, uh, you know, if I designed a store for you, a physical retail location, and during the big unveiling, we walk inside and I put huge exit signs right inside the front door, you'd say I was an idiot. If somehow people build websites every day by putting big social media icons, big candy coated, you know, colorful, tasty looking icons that take the visitor away. I don't know why they think that supports their goals. Anyway, another trick, Ali has the first person, he switches to first person. Book Ali for your marketing event, that second person, throughout the website, second person language. But then when he has the call to action, he switches to first person. I want Ali to speak at my conference. Famous study by Michael Agard and lots of other studies, I think, too, have, have concluded that um, you could get a higher conversion rate by switching the language in the CTA to be first person. Yep. So th with all that in mind, we get to uh, a little bit better decision making here on on the possible uh, layout. The other thing that Ali does here, and this is something that um, uh, as we look down the page, we see a huge video testimonial. We see social proof and evidence. Uh, we see Ali's points about his um, you know, information about his thing. And then you get to more endorsements and testimonials down here. And then uh, the bottom of the page, we've got the, the contact form again with like a mini version of a web page. It's got a headline. It's got the call to action in it. Uh, so this page is at 6,800 pixels tall. What percentage of that is evidence? 51% of the page is evidence. Again, my thesis, my theory, my hypothesis. There is no such thing as too much social proof. There, the more you add, the more compelling the page gets. The other thing that you just noticed on these, and this may be obvious to this group, I don't think we're talking to the beginners here, uh, I've never seen a study that showed that little short pages get higher conversion rates. I don't think that study exists. Don't make a short page. Why? It's uh, The goal of the page is to answer, here, think of it this way. The visitor came to your page because there's something, there's some true story in their life that brought them there. They arrived from a specific traffic source. They land on the page and they have questions, hopes, fears, concerns, desires, our job is to construct the page such that it answers all of those questions, supplies evidence to support each of the answers, and gives them clear specific calls to action. So we're going to guide their attention through a series of messages. That's Here's a page, just random website. It's got some content, then it splits to a three-column layout. They actually have social proof, but they strangely made the social, the um, third-party endorsements, the visual third-party endorsements, upgraded messenger, upgraded format. Um, gray on a colored background. And that definitely could have been more powerful if it was reversed, more visually prominent. And they've got a video, which maybe if that correlates with conversions, that's a good idea. But then look, we've got three different things in a three column. Then we got a two column layout, then a four column layout. That is not really doing a great job of steering the visitor's attention. Our job is to guide the visitor through a series of thoughts, giving them each thing one thing at a time so that they we know what they're thinking. We're taking them through, when Unbounce tested these landing pages by taking them through a series of, of messages, you see that they've got, you know, two things side by side and then a visual element down here and then, you know, what's that headline and then there's two columns of different things, faces kind of fighting with these value points. When they straighten that out and made it just one more united flow with only one thing in the top of the visual hierarchy at each scroll depth, it does a much better job of guiding the eye. Don't put separate columns, put them all together. In, fact, in that example, they got a 30% increase in, the, in uh, people signing up for the course. Works pretty great, right? So remove distractions, remove distractions. This is a, it looks like a joke. It's actually a real slide. It's a real screenshot. This box is presumably trying to get people to sign up for a newsletter. Why do they link to all these other things? Super weird, right? Terrible idea. Speaking of email signup forms, uh, we had this old email signup form on our site, which had a little blah, 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 blah. Switch it to this box. This box, that gave us a 1,900% increase in the conversion rates. Isn't that incredible? Why did that work? Well, the new email signup form had three things. They all start with P. I'm writing an article about this now, or updating an old article. Uh, they had promise, uh, prominence, big red box. Promise what you get web marketing tips and how often 
bi-weekly, and proof, social proof. If you want people to sign up for your form, make sure your form has these three Ps in it, prominence, promise, and proof. That little sign-up box there on our site uh, has done amazing things, right, for list growth for us. Now we have it as a prominent, you know, it's in the footer, it's a sticky footer, so it's quite prominent. It's uh, there on every page. Can't, no matter how far down you see it, you scroll, you see it. It also tells you the frequency bi-weekly in the topic, web marketing tips, and the, th the number of people. It's actually 14,000 people who have subscribed to this over time. Um, so that's going to increase your conversion rates. Uh, it's a little bit of social proof, and it's a powerful way to grow your list. So we're going to wrap up here, but before I do, I want to I hit that last point about the um, calls to action. Every visitor to every page, every viewer of every search results page, everyone looking at every social stream, everyone in a busy inbox, we are all, not them, it's us, it's everybody, doing a super fast cost benefit calculation before we click on anything. Every visitor to every page is doing a cost benefit calculation before they click on anything. So our job as marketers and writers of calls to action is to increase the benefit and reduce the cost, increase the return and reduce the investment. So generically, as labels we go, instead of just having a call to action that says, just do this thing, build up the value, increase the benefit, increase the return by saying, do this valuable thing. Longer, more descriptive, right? More reason to click or reduce the investment. Do this easy thing. Can you see the difference between these? Have you tried this? Try the, here's some more examples. Don't just download ebook. Download the ebook and solve all of your problems today. <laughs> Exaggeration, maybe a bit. Uh, or download ebook instantly reduces the cost, right? I can do it right now and start reading now. It sounds very immediate, right? I don't have to wait. Or instead of contact us, which is not a call to action, just a label, consider in being explicit about the benefit and the reason to contact them in the first place. Get in touch and start improving your click through rates today. Talk to an expert about your button text. Right? This reduces the investment. I'm not going to, I don't have to wonder, what am I doing? It's specific, and I can imagine it, and it's simple. I'm just going to talk to someone. All I'm, call, uh, all I'm doing is talking to someone. No big deal. So when we did that on our site, here's an example, right? What's your digital strategy? Picture of Sarah. You can imagine talking to Sarah. Do you know your visitors? Discuss your site with Sarah. So bottom line, we have to find and fill the gaps on our websites, and there probably are many. If you're missed answering a question, your site is unsatisfying. If you didn't supply evidence to support that answer, your site is weak. Go count the number of unsupported marketing claims. This is what a good marketer does. Find and support every unsupported marketing claim on your website. And if you don't have calls to action, your site is just not compelling. What is an FAQ page except important information out of context? If it's truly a frequently asked question, why didn't you put it on the page where the question pops into their mind? What is a testimonial except important supportive evidence out of context? What, do you think this visitor is going to click around and go to all the, you know, find this, make the case themselves and just, you know, go to FAQ and find the answers and go to testimonials and see the evidence? It doesn't make any sense at all. They're not going to click. They're not going to aim. They're not going to tap. They're going to keep scrolling. 100% of your visitors has their finger on a scroll wheel, a trackpad, or a piece of glass. Our job is to construct this experience such that it answers those questions, supports that evidence, and keeps them flowing down the page. Testimonials pages are terrible marketing. They almost never, <laughs> they rarely get clicked. It's the worst place to put a testimonial. We have a testimony, I, I, I have access to 750 analytics accounts, and this is very common. The testimonials page is like the 31st most popular page on a website. Not weird at all. I think of it this way. You know what's delicious? Butter. You know what's terrible? A plate filled with butter. No one wants to eat that, right? It's, it's an ingredient in something else. Random butter reference. So here's the results for the redesign of our own site where we applied these philosophies and principles, where we thought through the top questions, where we answered the, where we gave the most important answers, where we supplied evidence to support each answer. And the idea, and uh, the, it ends up looking at something like this. We had a 26.5% increase in conversion rates just by applying these principles and redesigning our own site. That's a 26% increase in leads, no difference in the quality of those leads. It's an increase in quality leads, and the uh, team is busy. <laughs> Do this well, and you have, you have upgraded your problems, but your new problem is something like this. 
you will be so busy that you have only two options. One, you can increase your prices, or two, you can hire people. That's what happens to B2B companies that are good at lead gen. That's what happens to brands that understand CRO. That's what happens to people that look at the site with, with findability and content in mind and then align the words and pictures and evidence and actions and with that visitor's context. So that wraps it up. Uh, the book I wrote is called Content Chemistry. You can find it anywhere you can find books. It's on Amazon or just search Content Chemistry. You can find it on our, off our site. And uh, we left a couple minutes for questions, so probably we should turn cameras back on. And uh, Talia can let me know if we've had some, uh, some uh, people who wanted just a bit more information or to chat. Yes. Wow. Um, I have to say that I was waiting for you to say that quote about testimonials because that is one of my favorite quotes ever. Um, oh, about the don't make a page? Yes. Um, just also, you know, um, the thing of the idea that everything that you say is marketing, but when someone mm. else says it, it's a testimonial and mm -hmm. I, I see so many websites when you look at their testimonials, it's like they are the number one X, Y, and Z. And it's always kind of asking people for this testimonial you think people want. It's like self praising and it's not really addressing a problem and, and social proof can address a specific problem and concern of a customer without you actually having to do it. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm always happy to hear more about social proof. <laughs> yeah, it, and it, it we didn't. I didn't really phrase it this way, but you just made an excellent point. The proof itself can answer the question. So instead of saying yes, we are pet friendly, the testimonial can say my my dog loves it here. Yeah. Then it's all understood. Another way to answer questions for people, and this this is common. People say, well, I don't want to talk about pricing. You still have to address it somehow. And one way that you can address the thing that you know, you're afraid to talk about can actually be with a call to action. So another, another way to do, to address a, a question is with the call to action. So we did another project for a, a college and they don't want to put the pricing for admissions. They don't want to put their tuition costs on the website, but they have to answer it somehow. So what they did was they just made it a call to action. Click now to speak with a financial aid advisor. Now we, you know, the visitor knows what they need to do to get that information. They need to start the conversation. They click, they chat, or they call. So uh, the important thing is not to leave these things unaddressed, but to address them somehow, either with content, as in marketing content, or social proof, or even calls to action. Awesome. No, I love it. Um, and we do have quite a few questions. Um, first, we have by Emmy, because we're just talking about social proof anyway, and she um, she asks if it's okay to have a testimonial if the reviewer wants to stay anonymous. It's imperative in certain cases because uh, not all of clients will give permission to use the testimonial. So it's a common question. Uh, my advice is to try to do something to support that marketing claim. The key is to add proof of some kind and not to have pages that are just like a brochure just filled with marketing fluff. So if, if, uh, if you can, add other types of social proof. But if you have a testimonial where you don't have permission to use their name, yeah, you can use the job title. If they're from a, a certain type of company, you can just name the, you know, from a Fortune 500. Or if they're just in an industry, you can say, you know, marketing manager from a, you know, B2B lead gen, whatever the, you know, just name the industry. But it's better than nothing. <laughs> it's definitely better than nothing. The most powerful testimonials will have the logo, the headline, the picture, the title, the company, um, and a keyword. But if you can't use that, then just use what you got. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, a question from Teddy. Should the call to action be the same on every page on your website in the funnel, or should there be a variety of wording? I recommend that it be contextual for the page. So if the page is about increasing your conversion rate, the testimonial can be contact us to talk about increasing your conversion rate. Think of it this way. What is the true story in this person's life that brought them to this page? Now, knowing that that is the context, the frame of reference and the, and the psychology of this visitor on this page, we have to align what we talk about with them. So you can make a generic testimonial and it might work, but we should at least try 
because it's all you're doing is changing button labels and links. You know, it's not like expensive or difficult. Just try making it relevant to that page. Talk to us about WordPress or ask us about search rankings or get information about, you know, speak to a financial aid advisor or uh, check if you could also use the, use the contact to indicate scarcity. Check on availability. Wow, maybe they're not available. You know, it, it, contact us is just, it's not a call to action. It's a navigation label and it's a missed opportunity to do something to leverage psychology in some way or at very least to be specific. I'll also say don't be shy to, to try three and five and ten word calls to action. It might look weird on mobile if the button if the button style wraps and it's like five lines tall, but uh, get past that and give it a shot and see if it works because uh, I'm I'm seeing more evidence that long calls to action are more effective. Yeah, I've actually written um, an article about that recently, and I give three different formulas for writing calls to action, um, and most of them are quite a few words. There's the actual action you want people to take, and then maybe a supporting uh, line for it. So, you know, act now to save 20% or mm. stuff like that that gives people not only um, the context of what they're going to say to do when they click, but also the result of it. Um, so there's all sorts of really cool ways you can write call to action buttons. Um, let's see. We have one other question about B2B, which has now eluded me. Oh, by the way, the butter quote. Crazy. I've never, I've never used that before, but does that, it makes sense, right? Yes, it does. Butter's delicious, but you don't want a plate of butter. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> exactly. It's an ingredient. Right. right. You would never serve a plate. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's powerful. I mean, the message is testimonials are powerful when they're sprinkled everywhere. They're weak when they're all together. A plate of butter is disgusting. Like no one's well, going to eat that. Well, Lionel says that asparagus, you might want a whole table, a whole plate of asparagus. Um, <laughs> so um, last question. Um, actually, Oh, actually I didn't notice. We run out of time <laughs> talking about butter. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I know. You've got a big day. There's more in this lineup. Um, Andy, just tell us, where can we reach out to you? How can we, you know, ask you more questions and get your attention? Uh, LinkedIn is probably one of my, LinkedIn and Twitter. I'm not active on Facebook, but connect with me anywhere you find me if you want. Connect with me any place that you like to connect with people. Um, Orbitmedia.com slash blog. I write a newsletter that is bi-weekly. So I don't bomb your inbox. It's, they, they tend to be detailed posts. Um, but that's a place to get my best advice every two weeks. Um, and also, uh, you know, events and webinars and uh, uh, connect with me, maybe LinkedIn. Find me on LinkedIn. Send an invite. I accept everyone that invites, that um, sends me a request and then ask me anything. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. I really appreciate your time. Guys, I'm going to end the broadcast and move you to the next room where Joanna's waiting for us. <laughs> Say hi to Joanna for me, please. I will. Bye. Thanks, Talia. Bye-bye.